choice on the teaching tonight. It's a, you know, it's good teaching with a bad title. <laughs> I think we've been calling it something like practical aspects of waiting on God. Uh, if I was to put it under a series heading, I might call it, Lord, what would you have me do? And I want to remind you of uh, a few things uh, as we get into, into this tonight. Yes, sir. Um, go to Mark somewhere <laughs> near the end. <laughs> uh, Mark 16. Most of you know I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church. Like Dave says, thank God for the Baptists. If it wasn't for the Baptists, where would we Pentecostals get our people, you know? I mean, thank God for them. They will work the town and pass out tracts and get you saved. Glory to God. But uh, when it comes to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, they, uh, their teaching is not the same. Let me just say, okay, I'll just be nice. We'll just stop right there. But in that denomination and many others, really, these two verses that we're about to look at, you could chisel them over the door. <laughs> You've got to remember, now we moved 17 times but while I was in the, between the first and the sixth grade. We moved just every few months. And, but my parents were faithful, and every new little town we moved to, Chickasha, Ardmore, Duncan, uh, Enid, Texarkana, Ruidoso, New Mexico, Dallas two or three times, Tulsa two or three times, everywhere that we'd go, they would find uh, a little church right away and we I don't know what it growing up I didn't know what it was not to be in church Sunday morning Sunday night Wednesday night that's just the way it was whether you liked it whether you didn't like it like Dave says and knuckle you in the head and get you down to church you know train up something about train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old <laughs> not that I'm old don't look at me like that but anyway I'm getting these two verses, now what's amazing, you can never chisel the next two verses over their door. <laughs> Just these first two. It's, John, it's Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. Now again, I mean, you could, boy, they believe that. They believe those two verses. And they believe in going into all the world and they'll send missionaries and finance missionaries. And I, how many knows we're all about that? I thank God for that. Now, I wish you could chisel the next two verses over the doors too, you know. And these signs shall follow them that believe. My voice sounds a little hot up there, Derek. Are you doing okay? <laughs> these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Well, I believe all four verses need to be chiseled over the door, don't you? We believe all of that. But I'm saying that to, the, to, to say this. Without the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the way I was raised, if you, want, if you really love the Lord and, and you felt the call to ministry, then... Eventually, you'd wind up going to seminary, and, and uh, you'd learn whatever denomination that you got saved in, and, and then eventually, you know, you graduate, and you've you got to somehow figure out what you are. Are you a pastor? Are you a missionary? Uh, what are you? And then, if you're a, a missionary, for example, then eventually, you got to make a decision, you know, and I'm not saying they don't pray. They do pray, but eventually, you got to make a decision, and we're going to see some other guys who were trying to make a decision, and they love God, and and they were doing their best to figure out what to do. But, you know, you have to say, well, I'm called to China. Well, how do you know? Well, I'm just, that's my, I think I'm called to China, you know. And that's the way you would do it. Or Vietnam or Sepulpa, wherever it is. I mean, some, hor some horrible heathen land. No, I'm teasing. I love Sepulpa. <laughs> I'm seeing if you're listening. Okay. <laughs> and that was my mindset. And see, the Lord will bless that. If he didn't bless that, there'd be a lot of ministries not blessed. <laughs> Just to be honest with you, that's the way most of them work. You know, you, you, uh, you, you do your best, pray and seek the Lord, but eventually you make a decision where you're going to go. Well, let's look at some guys that were doing that. Acts 16. Go over to Acts 16. This is Paul and Silas. Love the Lord. They're not trying to disobey God. They're trying to obey God. And they have finished an assignment, 
And uh, they don't really know what to do next, see. And this reminds me of the very first conversation I ever had with Pastor Dave after we had been here about five or six years, I think, a long time. It was about four years before he knew my name, I think. And uh, the decision I had with him was, or the decision, the conversation that I had with him was along this line. See, I, I was raised not only first, first in the Southern Baptist denomination, but then once I got filled with the Holy Ghost, I cut my teeth on what's commonly called the Word of Faith. And uh, now don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. I know there's excesses in that. But uh, thank God for the word of faith. If it hadn't have been for what I learned there on the foundations of faith, I would have died of cancer several years before we ever found the prayer center. But all I really knew was just, here's the word, you believe it, and you act on it. That's it. That's, that's how you live, you know. And Dave says, well, there's nothing wrong with that, you know. You know, the credo of a, of a faith man is, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm only moved by what I believe, and I believe the word of God. Nothing wrong with that. We should, he says, don't lose that. But he says, what, what if you take all of those attributes, and you take that same man then, and you teach him how to be led by the Holy Ghost? He says, because oftentimes, if you're just making decisions on your own, you'll wind up on a path that's good intentioned, it's well intentioned, but it's not really one that the Lord sent you down. Now, he will anoint that and bless you all that he can, but it's not the same as walking the path that the Lord has for you. So, David, that's, so that really got me interested and so forth. Well, now, coming to, to uh, Acts 16, we start in verse 6, and I'm, I'm just going to, I've taught on this so many times, I'm barely going to touch on it. What we're really going to look at again tonight is the rest of those prophecies that came forward during the conference, because that is the leadership of the Spirit. It's the mind of Christ for us in this hour. There's instructions in there for each of us. So anyway, starting in Acts 16, verse 6. Now when they had gone, this is Paul and Silas. When they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Boy, what? I grew up chiseled over the door. Go ye into all the world. Isn't Asia part of the world? And really what it's talking about there is the region around Ephesus. Now you do know that later on the Lord sent Paul to Ephesus. And he had a great ministry there. Stayed there several years. Had a great harvest, you know. Big church was established. Timothy eventually became the pastor of that church. But there is a mind of Christ. A present hour mind of Christ. He might send you to Ephesus later. But it's not his will that you go to Asia now. When I saw that, I'm going, this is a level of leadership that I was not taught in the denomination. But if that kind of leadership is available to us today, count Gary in. I want in on this. If that kind of leadership, how in the world do you start doing that? Let me recommend, let me take a time out and just recommend a book to you. It's called The Walk of the Spirit. <laughs> Somebody was about to write it down. <laughs> the Walk of the Spirit, The Walk of Power by Dave Roberson, the best book I've ever read on the subject. If you want to walk by his leadership and not your own mind, that's the best book. So anyway, let's go just a little farther. Now, can you see these guys? They were, they were thinking about going to Asia. They're just like anybody else with a natural mind. They love God. They're filled with the Spirit. They, they've been praying in tongues. But without this contact, without this leadership from the Holy Ghost, they would have wound up in, in Asia. Because that's what you can tell. That's what they were thinking about. But then, so, okay, all we know at this point, we, he doesn't want us going there right now. So that when they were come to, verse 7, when they were come to Mycia, they assayed. That's an old, that's a mining term, like when you, you weigh the, the ore, you know, you separate the gold from the not gold, and you assay, you weigh it in the balance. They were weighing in their mind whether or not to go into Bithynia. That's another region. They're thinking about it. Now, I kind of, <laughs> my meditation sometimes takes me probably too far, but I have this little picture, you know, well, okay, the Holy Ghost, he, we're not supposed to go to Asia. I know that. So I'm just picturing this. Silas turns to Paul. Paul, you ever been to Bithynia? No, I ain't never been there. I'll tell you, I was there last year. I'm telling you right now, I ain't nothing but a bunch of heathen. <laughs> 
If any place needs the gospel, Paul, I'm telling you, it's Bithynia. That's where we need to go, them Bithynians. We, they need to be saved. So they're, they're assaying, they're weighing in their mind whether to go to Bithynia. And this is exactly how I would have done it. In fact, this is my whole life before we come to the prayer center. I, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. In one of the face-to-face documents, it's called His Burden is Light. I had a, a vision there that I try and describe in word form in that teaching. And he showed me what my, following my natural mind had done to me. Here I'm trying to be led by the Holy Ghost. But my natural mind, hey, my mind can come up with a hundred things a day to do for Jesus. And not one of them be Jesus. <laughs> not one of them really be his mind. And he showed me in this vision how he's trying to lead me down a certain path. There's just one problem. I have got all these activities going on. And in the vision, I was, I was standing here, and all of those were like these big boulders. And by my own actions, I had tied myself to all of these different boulders. These were things that I had, my own mind had come up with. Yes, this is what I'm supposed to be doing for the Lord. And the truth of it was, hardly any of that was really what he wanted me doing for him. He had a plan for my life. And it wasn't any of that. And I had to learn from the Holy Ghost. He said, you're going to have to listen to me so you can become unfastened one by one from each of those things. Ruthie's nodding her head. She's, been, she's had that same lesson, I bet you. And he has to untether you from the plans of your own mind. <laughs> I hate to say it that way. But I, and I had good intentions. They had good intentions. And if they would have gone to Asia... Do you know what the Lord would have done? He would have blessed that all that he possibly could. If they'd have gone to Bithynia, he would have blessed that all that he possibly could. That's what he does. But it's not the same as finding out the mind of Christ for you today. Mm. Paul is a really smart guy. When he got knocked off that horse, I don't really know. It just says he fell to the ground when he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. He saw a bright light and heard a voice and he fell to the ground. Smart guy. First thing out of his mouth was, Who are you, Lord? (laughs) In other words, I don't know who you are. But if you've got that kind of power, you are Lord. That's a really good, smart thing to say. And then the second thing that he said was just as smart. Lord, what would you have me do? That same Saul is the one that later wrote Galatians 2.20. It's no longer I that live, but Christ liveth in me. The life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Now, there's a lot to that, a lot to that statement. But the beginning of that, you can see it right there on the Damascus Road. Paul's agenda for his life died that day. Saul of Tarsus, that was the end. You don't ever see him persecuting the church anymore. You don't ever see him trying to climb the ladder of religion anymore to become a uppity up in the you know, Sanhedrin or anything like that. His life, as he knew it, was over. I got good news for you. So was yours. <laughs> you have been bought with a price. Your life does not belong to you anymore. And that's the truth. But how do you, how do you find the, the reins? Like a horse has reins, you know. How do, you, how do you get the reins of his life where you can be like that horse that knows, he can feel that leadership, you know? You, you've got to find the real leadership. Well, it comes by the Holy Ghost. Don't you wish there was a church where you could learn how to find the leadership of Christ by way of the Holy Ghost? Oh, yeah, you're at the church. Glory to God. So, Lord, what would you have me do? Well, here, the Lord wouldn't have them go to Asia right then. And notice that they were thinking about going to Bithynia. But the Spirit, and that's a, that should be a capital S, the Holy Spirit, he suffered them not. Today's language, he said no. No, I don't want you. And really, he probably would have said no. He, the Lord, he doesn't want you going to, to Bithynia. Well, and if they passing by Mycenae came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. I've got to tell you again now, the longer you're in this, the Lord is perfectly capable of speaking to you in your known language. And he does. But the longer you're in this, you're going to find that the real language of the Holy Ghost is visions and dreams. He speaks in pictures. Okay? 
So it's not unusual that a vision would appear to you in the night, appeared to Paul in the night. And there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. Now, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. <laughs> but if I've been trying to find the mind of Christ for me, and I've been talking even with a good friend that I know is seasoned, like Paul and Silas traveling together, you know, what do you, th what do you think we ought to do next? Well, maybe we should go to Asia. What do you think? Well, let's go pray. And you find out, whoop, no, he doesn't want us going to Asia. <laughs> maybe, maybe Bithynia. Maybe we need to go to Bithynia. Boy, there are a bunch of heathen down there. And you pray, you seek the Lord, and you get No. And do you notice the Lord didn't tell him either time why? Isn't that interesting? I got delivered from why quite a few years ago. For there was a season where why tripped me up. But when, when you're owned, you don't really need to know why. You just need to know what, when, where, who, that type of thing. Sometimes he'll tell you why. Yes, sir. This is where this comes in. I, I recently had an experience of this. You know, y'all, uh, y'all, <laughs> I am from the South. Glory to God. You know that, uh, what was it, August? I think it was. I went to Columbus, uh, Ohio, first time I'd ever been there, to that church. And, and uh, on that, that particular one, I traveled by myself. Sometimes Sue goes with me. But I'm in the motel by myself on that one. And, and uh I think I mentioned to you before, while I was there, I got a call from a well-known minister in another country. I don't want to mention his name. I don't want to mention the country because I may get to go there sometime. <laughs> and this is a good ministry. I mean, this guy is very well-known. I mean, he has, when he has crusades, thousands of people come to it. I have never been to that country before. Uh, in, the, in the natural, if you're trying to build a ministry, if you're trying to get your name known if you want to go where the money is that's the kind of invitation you take in fact I was really honored that he would ask me to be honest with you I didn't even know how he knew my name <laughs> you know but uh, it was a genuine invitation but see I've been at this too long even while I'm on the phone I didn't even have to go pray about it even when I'm on the phone with him already in here right here for you that can't see me what is it? Solar plexus? <laughs> How does Dave teach that? Where is that voice of God? Is, is it your lungs? Uh, maybe your belly button. Is it higher? Maybe lower. I don't, it's there. I don't know. How do you, it, from the inside, I don't know. How do you point that? <laughs> it's not in my appendix. I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's in there. It's like prego. It's in there anyway. <laughs> I knew, and I didn't hear a voice. Sometimes you do. But if, if the book of Acts was still being written and Gary's name was in here and an invitation came from this country for Gary to go and the Holy Spirit forbade it. And that's exactly what it was. Holy Spirit forbade it. And so I, I, I mean, I was as nice as I could be and I just, and I really appreciated it and I really did and I said, please invite me again. <laughs> but I said, it's, uh, it's just not going to be able, I'm not going to be able to do it this time. Okay, I'm just not going to be able and again I've been delivered from why I didn't even pray about it didn't think about it at all now this is interesting to you guys what I'm holding up here these are the prophecies that came during the October conference that we just concluded here one of these uh, now you know I've told you before the Lord is holy the Lord is righteous and the Lord is sneaky <laughs> he's Jehovah sneaky <laughs> He will sneak up on you, get his mind across to you when you least expect it. I don't have very many meetings with Dave and Tim, but this time I would happen to be in a meeting with them. This is this, this week. And we were going over these prophecies, talking about some of them, and I happened to be reading these lines. Now, this is from the one on October 7th that says, oh, excuse me. Yes, October 7th. And the title they put on this one is called, Go to School, Pray, Get Yourself Ready. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I, I was reading these lines, and I got a phone call. While I'm reading it, and I've got two witnesses there, Tim and Dave sitting there, I'm reading out loud these, these words. 
And this is the one I mentioned in the, when I taught on this before. He says, always before he said to me, I'm only called to the hungry. But now he's saying you go and teach, whether they're hungry, whether they're not hungry. Let me read it to you. He says, I give you the keys. You need to teach them the keys. If they don't want to listen, teach them anyway. Now, I'm saying these words out loud. I'm reading it. They are listening in private, but they have their pride. So go on avenues. Ring, ring. Preach it. Ring, ring. Teach it everywhere that you can. Ring, ring. I answer the phone. It's this fellow wanting me to come preach at his church. Now, this is a little church, not very far away, about an hour and a half from here. I doubt there's, I, I don't want to put limits on it with my, it's not going to be thousands in attendance. Can I say it that way? <laughs> okay. I'm reading these words. Go on avenues, preach it, teach it everywhere that you can. The phone rings and they're asking me to come teach. Tim and Dave just look at me. And they go, did you get that? <laughs> Gary, can you get that? You, you, you think you know the mind of God on this one? So I said, yes, I'll come. <laughs> when do you want me to come? Now, this is the part I haven't got to tell them this yet because, again, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I eventually do get it. The date that they want me to come, I didn't dawn on me right then. dawned on me later. The date in November that he wants me to come is the same week that the other fellow had wanted me to be in another country. And if I would have accepted that one, I would have been out on the edge of his permissive will instead of right where he wants me to be. I am excited about going to this church. Who knows what God's going to do there? And it, it doesn't have to be some big, spectacular thing. You know, some, some little gal might get saved. Somebody might get delivered from drugs. Somebody might get filled with the Holy Ghost. And if it was my daughter, I'll tell you right now, it wouldn't be any price too high to get her delivered. Amen? God, is that good stuff? I'm telling you, this is still going on in our day. We have the leadership that comes by the Holy Ghost. You don't have to always know why. I, didn't, I don't know why. I just knew no. No, I just, no don't, don't accept that one in that other country. And then look how he did this, where even Gary couldn't miss it. I'm sitting there with Dave and Tim. I'm reading those words, and I get an invitation. Go preach, and they're just looking at me. Did you get it? <laughs> you think you understand the mind of the Lord? Okay, I'm coming. All right. And then later it dawns on me, oh, my God. If I would have accepted that other one, I would have been out of the country that very same week. And that's, you know, I'm sorry. That heats my chili. That spins my prop. That's what life is about. That's what makes following Jesus exciting and scary and wonderful. <laughs> you know, I love it. Well, I'm running out of time real quick now. So what I'm going to do now with the rest of this, is that enough? What we're after is the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And don't get me wrong. I love when Mark teaches about Listen, every little decision, I don't pray whether to tie my right shoe first or my left shoe first. You know, I don't have to pray about that. I don't have to uh, make a decision. If you call me and you want me to call you back, you know, courtesy says I'm going to call you back. I don't have to pray about that, okay? There's lots and lots of decisions that we make within the leadership of the Holy Ghost, okay? Uh, you know, do I stay at the Super 8 motel? Do, no, actually, I do pray about that. Because <laughs> not praying has got me in trouble before, but anyway... <laughs> That's another story. Good, some good stories right there. All right. Now I'm going to pick this up here. Picking, I want to talk about these prophecies that came forward during the conference. By the way, they are available already at Dave's website. Let me, I had trouble finding it, so let me tell you how to find it. You go to daveroberson.org. Then there's a place to click where it says media colon prophecies. Click on that. Then there's a, by year, they have all of these prophecies. Click on 2013 prophecies. Then in 2013, they have them by month. So you can click on October 2013 prophecies, and there they are. And, of course, the conference started October 6th. If I was you, I would back up to September 29th in preparation for the conference. There was three prophecies that came on that day. 
that to me are just very much part of the conference. Okay? So that, that's how you find them. Now, on my little page here, I have a little mark where we finished last time, and I'm going to pick it up there this time. And we're going to, we're going to glean a little more. It's because I'm telling you from hard experience, people, I have been at this a long time. It is so easy to just hear these prophecies, enjoy them, go to lunch afterwards, pound the table, talk about God, eat dessert, go take a nap, and then forget all about them. And then two years or three years down the road, you go, where was his leadership? And he'll bring you right back there. I, f I found one today. <laughs> He is Jehovah Sneaky now. He'll, he, he'll help you in spite of yourself. I found an instruction today that, to be honest with you, I had forgotten about. Lord, I don't want to have to say that. Gary, when did he say it to you? 2004. <laughs> this is 2013. I'm reminded of another minister one time where the Lord told him he wanted him to start developing. A, the Lord was going to start using him as a prophet, if I remember correctly. And what the guy liked to do was teach. So he kept teaching and teaching, and several years went by. And one day in prayer, the Lord said to him, What were you planning on doing about that prophet anointing that I gave you? And the man said, Lord, I wasn't planning on doing anything about that. That's exactly the way I felt today when I stumbled across. I didn't stumble across it really. That's the way it seemed. But he, he led me to this so I could see it again. Some, it's an instruction I got from him back in 2004. Now, to be honest with you, I'm pretty good about obeying instructions from the Lord. I am. I really am. Everything we do has come that way. But this is one. I've, I just let it go somehow. I don't, and I forgot about it. Did you know he doesn't forget about his own words to you? And I saw that, and I just was so embarrassed, and I was going, oh, God, I hadn't thought about that in years. And then I remembered that story, you know, like, Gary, what are you planning on doing about that? Lord, I wasn't planning on doing that. I'd just forgotten all about it. Lord, he said, well, you can't forget about it anymore. I'm going to have to talk. Now, now that time has gone by, to be honest with you on that one, I'm going to have to, get, I'm going to, have to pray because situations have changed a little bit. I'm going to have to get his mind on exactly how to do it now. But how many of you knows he, 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 he knew that was going to happen before it happened too. So that part of the plan exists. If you don't write anything else down, write this down. Nothing takes the Lord by surprise. He's never confused. He's never in worry. He's never like, oh, Gary forgot. What are we going to do? It's never like that. He knew I was going to forget before I ever knew anything. Before I knew anything. Nothing takes the Lord by surprise, and therefore you can trust his leadership right where you are, even if you just found out you've been disobedient for that many years. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I'm going to pick this one up now, October 9th, 2013. This is one of the prophecies that came through the conference. That they put titles on these. I love this one. It says, you have all the authority of the impossible in you. How he said it to me in the face-to-face -face documents, that same thought. He says, we have been made the agents of authority. The Holy Spirit, he is the agent of power. Did you ever notice that Jesus, even though he was the fully manifested Son of God, never did one miracle, never healed one person, never did anything like that before he got baptized in the Holy Ghost? And the religion will get mad right here, but if you ask, well, why didn't he? The real answer is he couldn't. He's not the agent of power. He was coronated the day he was baptized by John in the river. He was crowned, coronated, however you want to put it. That may not be the right word. Crowned is better. As the last man, the second Adam. That's the day that the Holy Ghost came on him. He was God's man of authority on earth. But the Holy Spirit is God's agent of power. Those two began to co-labor. Now, here's another thought. Was the Holy Spirit, is, is he everywhere? Isn't the Holy Spirit God just as much as God the Father, God the Son? 
Did the Holy Spirit have power before the day Jesus was baptized in the Holy Ghost? Is it not the, the will, uh, is it not the plan for the Holy Spirit to manifest the Father's will? Why didn't he do it? Why didn't he heal all those people before Jesus was baptized in the Holy Ghost? Quiet in here now. He's not the agent of authority. He is not the one that has been given the authority. That authority, what did Jesus say? All authority in heaven and in earth has been given unto me. Therefore, you go in my name. And when we go as his agents of authority, that's why we say in his name. It's not like a rabbit's foot you had, you know. <laughs> I believe I receive a new Cadillac car. Oh, oh, in the name. No, it's not like that, you know. No, when you find out his plan and you go on his assignment, when we send an ambassador to another country, they are supposed to go there representing the interests of the United States of America. He sends us as ambassadors for heaven, and we have come to represent the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and we have come in his name to bring the Father's will to planet earth. God, it's good stuff. But we are going in his name, not in our own. We are going on his mission and not our own thinking. Amen? So this, this word that day said, he is not allowing us in this conference to accept last year as being great. You are his child. You have all the authority of the impossible in you already. That is exactly true. We are... Uh, Alan taught about, don't, don't let anybody make you feel less spiritual than they are. It doesn't mean they're not more experienced. Dave is more experienced than me. That's, that's why I'm following Dave as he follows the Lord. But I like how Alan said it. You are God's spirit-born child, and it doesn't get any more spiritual than that. <laughs> You're not a second-class child. Actually, you are his favorite. Well, and so are you, and so are you, and so am I. <laughs> <laughs> nobody's more spiritual than Gary Carpenter yeah, Gary wants to slap his own face when he says that because Gary knows Gary but I'm talking about Gary the son of God see his favorite by the way <laughs> okay <laughs> the next one y'all having a good time the next one here this is a, a, the title on this one set a new example of revival being a child of God. Now, those of you that are old timers here, that's been here a long time, like I have, and Daisy has, and Derek and Diana, and I could, you know, there's others around the room. Uh, the Zanstras have been here forever in three days, and and many others, you know. I'm sure none of you have ever had the thought like, we should have been in revival by now. I mean, this is. This isn't how they did it in the old days. I've, I've read about the Azusa Street. I've read about the Welsh Revival. Aren't we supposed to go get a cardboard box and put it on our head? And, 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 and that's, how they, that's how they did it at, at, in that revival, you know. He's not doing something that he's done before. He is calling us to a revival like has not been seen since the book of Acts. And he prophesied that. He said it again during the conference. Came, I, here's the way it was said. If you are feeling resistance in your life, nobody, nobody's feeling that, right? Okay, I thought not. <laughs> it is because he is asking you as a family, as a body, to set a new example of what revival is. A new example of what being a child of God is. If all he was after was a gifts revival, we could have been in that years and years ago. There has been lots of those. Most of the revivals, the healing revivals that you read about in the 40s, right after World War II, were those kind of revivals, gifts revivals. Yet you read about all kinds of scandal that happened in a lot of those. Not, not all of them, but a lot of them. And some of the doctrine, I mean, they'd go out in empty wheelchairs and raise the dead. That same book that Mark was talking about, I read it too, you know. I mean, the miracles are just, you go, oh, my God. Then the guy teaches, and you go, what planet are you from? Do you, do you own a Bible? You know? 
This is not the kind of revival that God is, is calling us to. He is calling this time to set. I'm probably not going to say it as well as somebody will say it later. The, people, the world has to see Jesus. And they need to see the Jesus grown up, manifested in his body. Can't be bought, can't be bribed, can't be intimidated. Nothing, nothing but the Father's will. That's us. That's where we're headed. It's a family revival. I like, I like how it's worded there. Hmm. The next prophecy that we got this time, adding strength to your foundation. I want to read this one. It's really small. I'm going to read the whole thing. It says, I am very well pleased. And he said it again. I am very well pleased with the direction that this has taken. For what, it re for what it will result in is adding strength to your foundation. You will find out that in places where you couldn't succeed before. Now, are you listening? Nobody but me has had any failures. That's probably why this hits me stronger than it does you. You will find out that in places where you could not succeed before. You will begin to succeed now. Lord, the last 12 people I laid my hands on that were sick, God, they died. <laughs> or whatever it was that you tried to do, you know. Maybe you're a gospel entrepreneur. Yes, Lord, I'm going to make millions. Trouble is, I'm broke. <laughs> From all the wrong decisions I've made to this point. Whatever it is, see, whatever it is, I'm going to read it again. You will find out that in places, those same places where you could not succeed before, you will begin to succeed now. Why? Because I will teach you how to work the answers out ahead of time, no, ahead of you, before you get there, says the Lord. You're going to find that same statement in the face-to-face -face things. I would have to research it and find out which one, but in there he talks about the Holy Spirit there's a segment in there where he talks about it's really the will of the Lord. Now, he said I would have trouble when I teach this because it's really hard when you're first learning how to begin to hear his voice. In my mind, I'm usually, I needed to hear it yesterday. Like, Lord, carest thou not that we perish? <laughs> the, sink is, the, the ship is sinking. The boat's full of water. And we're about to go down for the third time. And I, I needed to hear you three days ago. And I'm praying, God. And see, and most people can relate with that. Uh, I even heard Benny Hinn say this one time. I don't think it's true, but it, it seems true to us. Benny Hinn says, oh, God always answers right before you die. <laughs> and how many of us could relate with that? I mean, no, they, oh, come on now. I, you know, you, you've been there. And that's the way it seems. But what he told me was the mind of Christ is that we receive instant answers for instant problems. And he went a step further. He says... And even more, it is his desire that we know the answers to problems that we haven't even seen yet. He said, if you spend time with my spirit, I will show you how to solve that problem before you even know you have that problem. He said it, and he said it through me on, on that face-to-face. -face. Here he's saying it through Dave. This is one that came through Dave, I'm pretty sure. And it doesn't matter who it came through as long as it's the Holy Ghost. Amen? Listen to it again. You will find out that in places where you could not succeed before, you will begin to succeed now. Because I will teach you how to work the answers out ahead of time. Ahead of you. Before you get there. Says the Lord. Isn't that good? Whew. Okay, here's another one. This one's titled, I can close the gap between the lost and being saved. The Lord says, it delights me beyond anything that you can understand when you turn me loose in your life in such a way that you will let me begin to direct it supernaturally. That's a mouthful. We could have a whole conference right there, just that sentence. Let me say it again. How many of you want to delight the Lord? I want to delight the Lord. I want him, I want him to go, yeah. 
I want him to have a good day. <laughs> he says, it delights me beyond anything that you can understand when you turn me loose in your life in such a way that you will let me begin to direct it supernaturally. Is that not exactly what we saw with Paul and Silas in Acts 16? He's directing them supernaturally. He says, because you will see as much as I love the lost, when you do this, do what? Turn him loose to begin directing your life supernaturally. You make it so that I can close the gap between the lost and being saved. Because you are praying in a language I have given you. And I can say these things and also prepare you for them. I, I, it sounds like he wants us to pray in tongues. Who knew? My goodness. I've been here 20 some odd years and he wants me to pray in tongues. My goodness. I think I've got a revelation. Now this one is, this one's wonderful and scary. It's titled, Your Decision. How much you want to serve me. I want to read this one all. I've, I've got a little, some of it highlighted, but I'm going to read all of this one. He says, there are many of you that believe that you have a calling with me, and some of you are not sure. But I can say this to you, that you cannot settle yourself in to praying in the language that I have given to you and remain in the same place and not find out what I have for you. Now, I was speaking to... Two different men on opposite ends of the country today by telephone. And if you're listening, this, you know who you are. <laughs> but you're typical of, of most who begin this process. I was exactly like this. I'd pray. And the, how many of you ever asked God for direction and the silence was deafening? You know, man, that was me. See, I couldn't, I couldn't hear God. I couldn't hear God. But what he's saying here, listen to me, you fellas, and everybody else that's, that's like that. He says, you cannot settle yourself in. Now, settle yourself in means get a pattern in your life. Get, settle yourself into a pattern of praying in this language. You can't do that. You cannot settle yourself in to praying in the language that I have given to you and remain in the same place and not find out what I have for you. He says you can't do it. If, if words mean anything, it means you can't do it if you tried. Well, I can't hear him. I'm telling you, you have it on the authority of Almighty God. You cannot settle into a pattern of praying in, in, in tongues and not find out what he's called you to do. You may not hear it in a voice the same way I do. You may not see it in a vision the same way Paul did. But God is smarter than you are dumb. He's quicker than you are dense. I'm speaking from experience. <laughs> He will get it across to you. You will know. Then it says, then he says, if you will take the time with me, I will take the time with you. Well, that's an invitation. You will see, you can walk into everything I have for you and out of everything I have freed you from. I got to go pray now. I'm sorry. <laughs> Boy, if this doesn't drive you to the prayer closet, I don't know what will, you know. And he's, we haven't quite finished this one. And he says, and you know what is so good about this? It can be your choice and your decision how much you want to serve me and how much you want to walk after the Spirit and be led and conquer those things that I set you up against. <laughs> I'm telling you, if you, don't, if you haven't already printed your own copy of these, this is your meat. This is your food. Digest this. Pray over this. Read it again. Say, Lord, talk to me. What, is, what are you saying to me? Well, he's saying, it's our decision. How much I want to be led. Okay, I can't camp on one. We'll try and finish these tonight. Now, this one is called My Love and the Fullness of It. Every time my church, during their dispensation, would get serious 
on me and serious about prayer and fasting that the love, my love, and the walk in it would spring up time after time because this is who and what I am, says the Lord. They will not travel down the path I have laid for them supernaturally without running into my love and me wanting to bring them forward into the fullness of it. For in that, there is no fear. And in that, you will never fail. Isn't that something? Mm. So this one says... Go after the love of God with tenacity. He said, covet earnestly the best gifts, yet I will show unto you a more excellent way. Though I speak with tongues of men and angels and have not love, what he was saying is, the more excellent way, if you go after the love of God with the same tenacity that you would have gone after the workings of miracles, that would have exalted you in the body of Christ, you know, yeah, yeah, come out. <laughs> now, Dave was speaking this from a line, but it is prophecy all the same. You know how Dave is. If you go after the love of God with that same tenacity, that we would go after that kind of power, that is the more excellent way. When you go after the love of God with the tenacity not to back down, then everything you need to minister and to help, eventually, you will be equipped with. What, what do you say after that? You've got to go after the love of God. I don't, I don't know how to do that without turning myself over to the Holy Ghost. I just recently saw the love of God manifested in Stephen. I always admired Stephen. He was full of faith, it says, full of power, full of the Holy Ghost, did great signs and wonders. But the words, Stephen was full of the love of God, that's not in there. And it took forever for the Holy Ghost to get it across to me. My God, when he prayed for those men that were stoning him to death, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. That's the same love that was in Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And I, then it finally hit my lightning quick mind. The reason that Stephen was full of power, faith, signs and wonders was because Stephen was full of the love of God. He had followed the more excellent way. My God. And this last one is called Working My Plan Purposely. This is the last one. This is speaking especially to the conference people. And I know many of you couldn't be here. You know, a lot of our people actually work and have jobs. You know, it's amazing. But, <laughs> but this is to us as much as it is to them. So the Holy Spirit was like, in conclusion, at the, right at the end of the conference, he was saying, take these things home with you that you have learned, these things that you have heard, and exercise them. You will find that they will work the change in your life that some of you have been looking for. And you know that there is more for you, but you don't know how to get there. But I would say to you, boy, when you work my plan purposefully, my plan will unfold for you purposefully. For there is not one in here that I have not given my plan to, and not only my plan, but the way that you have a choice to pray that plan out. It's all yours if you want it. And it is your choice whether you can go into the living and active and powerful things I have for you or just sit on the sidelines. But I'm not called, someone might say. And the Lord says, you don't have to be called. These signs follow them that believe. (laughs) 
Listen, when he gets it down simple enough where I can understand it, (laughs) we have become accountable. I see instructions for Gary in here. I see uh, for sure things that I I need to do. I've got to go back. uh, Okay. Just tell it plain. The, the, The more you... The more he answers your prayer, the harder it is to pray. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. Most people, one way or another, are praying, use me. One way or another. Whether they're actually saying, put me in ministry or not, I don't know. I wasn't really praying that. But in one way or another, you're all going, I want to be used more. As he begins to use you more, you start getting so busy that you don't have time to pray. And you get physically tired and say, I've got an hour left today. Let's see now. Prayer and fasting or television? Oh, I'm tired. It's going to be a long day tomorrow. Now, I'm not against, we need some relaxation. You understand what I'm saying? Don't get me wrong. I'm not, we're not casting out the demon of television or anything. <laughs> Unless we need to. No, I'm not going to anyway. <laughs> No, but he's just plainly saying it's our decision, see. And this, this problem doesn't get easier as your ministry grows. It gets harder. And it's hard to find that balance between false responsibility. I was on the phone today. I don't do this very often, but today I was on the phone and email, really just kind of catching up because I didn't get to do hardly any of that during the conference. And I was just kind of catching up today. And... Uh, I was on the phone and email, uh, not overestimating, at least four to five hours, somewhere right in there today. And I hope that was okay with him. But I know if I get involved with that to the point that becomes my life, where I spend my four, five, six hours a day on the phone with people, I mean, it's good, it's better than nothing. But that's not what he's really called Gary to do. It's not called me to that. He, if I, that's the kind of thing, if I'm not careful, I will start tying myself with ropes to the boulders again. Well, I've got to go make the phone calls. I've got to go do this. I've got to go do that. And even as I say this, those of you that I talk with today, I had a great time. It was wonderful. Don't, you know, we're going to talk some more. But I know that's not the path. That's not the ultimate plan for my life or yours. What we have to do is pray, fast, get quiet. Really learn how to wait on God. Start getting His instructions. It's the only thing that matters. I don't really want Him to anoint my plan. I want to find His plan. It's already anointed. And there's the difference. I don't want Him to bless what I'm doing. I want to get in on what He's doing. Whatever part I have in that, that's all I want. And I don't care about anything else. Amen? Except maybe an hour of TV once in a while. No, I'm teasing. (laughs) You got to be careful with people. They become religious nuts. I love you as I say that, but you might be one. God called you to be a husband, men. Take your wife on a date once in a while. Hey, Hey, got any women? Got any wives in here? When's the last time you took your wife on a date? Called you to be a husband. Called you to be a, a father. Okay, I've got to quit. <laughs> We're not so spiritually minded. We're no earthly good. I can't, I can't pray all the time and neglect my grandkids. Come on. There's a, you got to find that balance. You've got to settle into it. And he will help you do that. That's what I'm saying. Hallelujah. I want to read this last thing. Um, maybe two last things. Hmm. This is a, a little part from that one of those face-to-face that I mentioned called His Burden is Light. I'm just going to read part of this one. The full document is at the website. It's in the uh, media face-to-face section. It's there in written format. and then Also, I read them all so you can play it if you want to. This is what he said to me. He said, Freedom comes by being released from all of those things except those that I bring to you from the mind of Christ. Did you hear that? 
Let me say it again. Freedom comes by being released from all those things except those that I bring you from the mind of Christ. Freedom comes in having no responsibility except to do those things which he assigns you each day. And that is freedom indeed. The assignments that come from his mind put the responsibility on me, and that's talking about the Holy Ghost. They are simple actions on your part to be done. Simple words to say, places to go, people to see, messages to deliver, things of a simple order. The responsibility for accomplishment of the mind of Christ is mine, says the Spirit of Grace. The season you are entering is where you shall learn what this word means. Not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. I have come to untangle you from the ropes. Now, this is, a con this is a condensed version here that I carry with me all the time. These are instructions that I have gleaned out. He had already shown me that vision where I was tied off with all these ropes to these different boulders to the point I couldn't even do what he was telling me to do next because I had all these false responsibilities, and I, you can't just not do them. But I have to, So he says here, I have come to untangle you from the ropes. I will untie them, I will remove them, I will disentangle you from the snares as you hearken to my counsel and obey my voice without question. As the master administrator, I will give you an instruction. As you obey that instruction, another rope shall fall from around your waist. I will give you another instruction, and as you obey that instruction, another rope shall fall from around your waist. As this process continues, you shall be free. Boy, he got me free, too. Every instruction that they receive from me, it will not add to their burdens. It will free them from their burdens. For the instructions that come from the mind of Christ are intended to loose me and my power in the lives of every believer. His instructions do not come in such a fashion that I would stand idle while men would work. Did you hear that? His instructions come that men can rest in the freedom which belongs to the sons of the living God while the Spirit performs all things according to my power that is resident within myself. Your responsibility as I come with instruction that will disentangle you from the ropes is to not pick the ropes back up after I have loosed you from them. And that sounds real simple. I lived it. When it's your rope that you made, there is some pride in it. This is a good work, Lord. We can't just, no, Lord, no, no, let it go. No, I worked hard to make that rope. It's got you tied to a boulder. Let it go. No. You'll find out. <laughs> you just don't know what the ropes are yet in your life. He says, let them go. Turn them over to me. Trust me that I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Our mind, even when you're doing your best to serve the Lord... Now, I really love you to tell you this part, and then I'm going to quit. <laughs> Some of these things that he was talking about. All right. This wasn't one of them, okay? But it's, a, it's the best example that I can use. I, I don't want to use the particular ones because there's people. But I can use this one. Y'all remember when he told me to end the Bible study? We did that Bible study for two years. He told us to start it, and he told me when to, when to stop it. He didn't give me much warning. I mean, it was only a few hours. It was the same day. And he told me, like three or four hours before the Bible study, he said, this is the last one. And I was not yet delivered from why. <laughs> and it was, why, God? Now, it's the same principle as here. See, he's, he's cutting that rope. He's cutting it. You ought to have heard all of my arguments. Lord, these people, they need me, Lord. They need who? What? Wait, back up. What? He didn't do it that way, but I look at it now and I'm thinking, 
I'm grateful thunderbolts didn't come out of heaven, you know. Well, Lord, what will happen to them? Would have to come into my Bible study. That kind of thing. When he starts snipping away the ropes, you're going to find that they were of your own making. It's not as easy to let those go as you think they are. It's kind of your baby. But if he's saying, let it go, you got to let it go. Okay. So when he says, don't pick them back up, trust me that I know what I'm doing. Trust me that I am bringing you the very mind of Christ. Trust me that I can set you free even while taking the burdens that you have carried upon myself. Do not pick up the ropes as they fall. Let them fall that you may go free. All right. I'm going to read you a confession that I wrote based on the face-to-face instructions many years ago. I, this was for my own use. I'm just sharing it with you. You don't have to repeat after me. But uh, if you want to later, you can get a copy of this, and you can if you want to. But I wrote this based on things that he had said to me and also in the Word. I call it learning to co-labor with the Holy Spirit. So I would make this confession. Holy Spirit, I know that you are with me. You and I have both been sent in the name of Jesus to restore the Father's will in the earth. We are co-laborers together in this matter. There is no division between us. I am the vessel of authority whom Jesus has sent. You are the agent of power to manifest the Father's will in the name of Jesus Christ. Christ has imparted his life unto my spirit when I was born again. You are with me to anoint that life with the dominion of the Father. Without Christ, I can do nothing. Without you, I will never have his mind. But I have his life within me, and you anoint that life with dominion. You and I are co-laboring together to restore the Father's will in the earth. Jesus has sent me into the Father's garden to be a vessel through whom the Father can work to restore the garden to his original intent and purpose. The Father works by the power of his own spirit, and I know that you are with me to manifest the Father's will. An enemy has done great harm to the Father's garden. I have been authorized by Jesus to drive out the enemy wherever I find him. When I find the enemy, I cast him out with my words, and you drive him out with your power. I see how we are co-laboring together now. There is no possibility that you will not move to perform the Father's will. Last paragraph. You keep me in constant communication with the mind of Christ, my Lord. You bring me the knowledge of his will in every circumstance. I revel in the light of your counsel. I am not walking in the dark. There is no occasion of stumbling as I follow your leadership, and I trust you completely. With great confidence, I obey without question every instruction you bring me from the mind of Christ. I have no need to fear, for you are with me. I think that will still preach today. That's where it is, see. And in this conference, it doesn't really come by making that confession. That just, that's, these are things that help Gary. Where it's really at is praying in the Spirit. You look at all those prophecies and again and again and again. Even those of us that's been here 20 some odd years, he's saying again, pray in the Spirit. Fast. Meditate my word. Spend time waiting on me. Hear my voice. Do what I say. And you will accomplish the Father's will. Did you get anything out of that? Man, I preach myself happy. I'm going to have to go pray and everything now. Glory to God. Well, Father, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us during the conference. Thank you for making it simple enough that we can understand it. But, Lord, we really need your help. It's so wonderful to be here tonight. And I feel your presence. And they do, too. And it's easy to hear and, and like, really dedicate to do these things. But then tomorrow, Lord, we're faced with that devil of Samo. Tomorrow, the problems. Tonight's service will seem like a long time ago. 
And it's so easy to just forget and slip into the natural. Father, help us. Help us, Lord. Remember what you said so that your will can be accomplished through our lives. Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name.